1973 saw the release of a film so intense that people were actually getting ill while watching it in the theater during its release. Stay with us for The Exorcist. Get ready for the 3324 Podcast, where lifelong friends Dean Legiro and Eric Coover share their love of all things music and movies. Dean has directed short films and is a music trivia buff. And Eric, trained in audio engineering, brings his extensive knowledge of music and film to the conversation as they discuss, debate, and celebrate their favorite albums, films, and much more. Welcome, friends, to the 3324 Podcast. Halloween edition, Eric. We always <laughs> we always the time a year horror. already. It is. Holy we shit. Always, yeah. we, we, pull, we pull the horror stuff out once a year. We dust it off like everyone does with their Ben Cooper costumes that they have in the attic. <laughs> Please tell me you're not going to do another episode on Ben Cooper. No, one, one was plenty. One are we going to do enough. this biography maybe? <laughs> Six minutes of Ben Cooper was more than anybody ever wants to know, wants to have. Maybe, maybe, except maybe our guest. Our guest, Andrew Kermeens, is a might be a big Ben Cooper fan. Oh, I am. I have a shirt and everything. Yeah, see? See? There's some. There's a select. It's a niche. It's a niche thing, and Andy fits right into that niche like a like a, like a a triangle peg into a triangle hole like, like those kids used to play with, with the shapes. He fits in perfectly. Oh, well, I am. I, I'm I'm happy to be here, and I've I brought Pazuzu with me. Oh Andrew. shit! No! What did you? What are you doing? Don't show me that! I don't want to. No! I don't want to see it. <laughs> I got my. <laughs> yeah, I brought uh -oh. my, my Pazuzu idol. Eric, do you have a Pazuzu also? I do not. You don't, because no. you no. you have like a lot of those replica things too, and you know. Oh, wow, wait, I, Andy, Andy, is that Pazuzu anatomi anatomi anatomically correct? It is, but I don't want you to digitally blur it out for YouTube. Um, but, um, my, my, my wife got, got me this, uh, and uh, Elaine Dietz, who, who did the voice for uh, The Exorcist, or the face, uh, she signed the bottom of it, so it's oh, pretty that's cool. cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, that, yeah. That's really cool. I wouldn't mind having that. Yeah. I know Janai would. For, my sister for the, would. For the man who has yeah. everything, a, a Pazuzu statue. Yeah. Okay. Things have gone downhill <laughs> since it's been in the house. <laughs> See, the strange yeah. occurrences. A rat, rat in the rat in the attic. Uh, if you don't know, well, well, if you're not sure who Pazuzu is, turning tuning into this, well, you're going to find out a little later on. But again, Andrew Kermeens is with us. Uh, Andrew Kermeens art on Instagram. We'll drop a link in there. The guy is as busy as heck. So uh, I'm glad he was able to uh, break himself away, maybe for a little leisure time to talk about this movie. Oh, yeah. Um, he's doing a lot of, a lot of great work. Uh, seems to be uh, a, almost a uh, adjunct uh, employee of Metallica at this point. Yeah, there's a lot coming out uh, that I've already done, and I'm doing a lot more before January. So it's... Uh, wow. Um, right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. cool. I got to go see them in uh, L.A. and um, got to be in the Snake Pit. and. Um, Dave Grohl was there, and yeah. um, that was pretty cool. It was just neat, you know. I, nobody bothered him really while the music was playing, but it was just, uh -huh. you know, hey, there's Dave Grohl that, right there. Is he tall? Yeah. Is he is he is he tall or no? Um, no, he, he, I'm six one, and he is about here to me. So okay, I guess so maybe about five ten. Yeah, five ten uh, six. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Jason Momoa was there in the pit, and. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, John Travolta was at the show. I didn't see him, but um, apparently he was taking pictures with Pantera and stuff like that, which is just bizarre to me. <laughs> yeah, that's strange. Um, <laughs> but it was cool. It was just like the hometown show or whatever. It was SoFi Stadium. It was like 100,000 people, two nights, and wow. uh, sold out both nights. And it was pretty cool. It's my daughter's first big metal show. So, Did you bring the headphones, the earphones? No, she, had, she was a champ. Wow. She's, yeah. she, she got the full blast experience. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, follow Andrew on, on Instagram, Andrew Kermeen's art. Like I said, we'll drop a link in, in the, uh, in the show notes for his Instagram and you can see all the great artwork he's doing for Metallica and other, other pro He does a lot of other projects too. Busy guy, busy, busy bee. Uh, Eric and I, yeah, we just kind of do this once a week. <laughs> but it's fun. It is fun. Oh, it's a, it's a blast. This is like one of the most fun things, to, fun things to do. You can do us a favor, uh, whatever podcast platform you're listening on, give us a five-star review. If it goes up that high, if it goes to four, we'll take the four then. Uh, but go ahead and do that. It helps our placement, helps kind of move us up in, in search results. Uh, and yeah, helps more people find us. So that would be a great thing. 
to do, right, Eric? I mean, you know, five star, five star, five star. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think so. <laughs> Not too much of an ask. You get free entertainment. But the episodes are always free. Give us a review. So anyway. Now that we've got all the housekeeping out of the way, let's get into the stats of this film. Let's get into the conversation because I have questions about this film um, because I am no. by no means an expert on this film. So, no. uh, and I, and I walked away watching it with a couple of questions. So forgive me if I, if I ask like stupid, silly questions, but you know, you've already shown me Pazuzu. I've already looked into the eyes of Pazuzu. So it's, it's over for me anyway. What Not difference? just his eyes. <laughs> His, uh, forget it. <laughs> His third eye. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's just nope. leave it. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I couldn't. I had to. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this was released in December of 1973, <laughs> directed by the late William Friedkin, who just passed away. Yeah. Uh, in August. Uh, written by the uh, screenplay was written by William P Peter Blatty. Based on his novel, which he wrote in 1971. So this was kind of a hot, hot commodity. This kind of came to fruition pretty quick. Uh, $12 million budget. Now, box office, 66.3 million box office at the time. With re-releases and all that other stuff, it's upwards of like 200 and something million or whatever. Uh, adjusted for inflation, the, the highest grossing horror film of all time until it the theatrical uh, version mm, of it yeah. came out mm -hmm. and that wow. became the highest grossing. Yeah. So it, it held the horror, uh, horror, highest grossing horror, R rated horror title, uh, through, until that, until the, uh, the recent it, wow. uh, nominated for 10 Oscars, only one, two best sound. Okay. Uh, and then, and then, uh, Blatty won for best screenplay from another medium, which is kind of, I guess they call it now best adapted screenplay, but, or, you know, from another medium, medium. What director beat them out, you know? Uh, that year. Yeah. I, that was I, the I mean, year of the, the, that, the sting. Yeah. The sting came one. out that year. Yep. Oh, um, George Roy Hill. <laughs> Did yeah. he win best director for that? What a, uh, what a shame. Cause this is one of the best directed horror movies yeah the george george roy well here here you go okay let me throw let's start here then because you asked the nominees for best director that year bernardo bertolucci for last tango in paris mm -hmm. william friedkin for the exorcist ingmar bergman for cries and whispers george roy hill for the sting and george lucas for american graffiti mm. ah okay so there's some tough you know, going up against Ing Ingmar Bergman, who is an auteur, uh, bar none, you know, uh, Bertolucci also. But uh, so Friedkin was in good, you know, it was a tough race there. George Lucas probably would have been the dark horse yeah. to yeah. win. You know, American and, Graffiti is a great film from that year, but and not, Freakin, on the, not on the par of this. And Friedkin won for uh, French Connection, so they probably yeah. frowned upon said, them you, winning you one more than one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and the, st point, yeah. the Sting won for Best Picture. Uh, Jack Lemmon won for Best Actor. Glenda Jackson, uh, you know, Tatum O'Neill won for Best Supporting Actress. She was the youngest. Uh, I'm uh, yeah, that it's, that in itself blows my mind because when we'll get to that, but uh, what? Yeah. The, what's crazy is, is uh, just just hearing this. I I just was recently on a plane and uh, they on Delta you can watch movies and stuff. And I watched American Graffiti. I haven't seen it in uh, I don't know fifteen twenty years and. Um, it's interesting because some of the comments that I'm about to have about this movie is about the, the cinema verite, you know, like just putting a camera and just watching people do things sort of thing, uh. feel the feel of it. And, uh, that, that movie American graffiti was very much so. So I'm wondering if this is kind of like that renaissance of just kind of letting, letting it not feel like a production and more of the real, you know, I know that yeah. kind of was at the end of the sixties, early seventies, but yeah, I think you start to they that's how they, and those, yeah, those directors. Yeah, that's how they all started out. Yeah. The movie brats, uh, De Palma. Yeah. They were all like, yeah, Coppola, Coppola, they all, you know, yeah, they yeah. all kind of let let the let this stuff unfurl. Uh, yeah, and, and The Exorcist certainly uh, is one of those films. Uh, brief history. So we like to talk about alternate casting. Um, originally for Father Karras, for Father Damien Karras, Paul Newman was was looked at. Uh, as was Jack Nicholson. Now, now one flew over the cuckoo's nest hadn't come out yet. So Jack Nicholson was still kind of a, not a major actor. 
Yeah, don't don't think of don't think of McMurphy. Don't think of McMurphy. But w- Paul Newman, no, I can't see him. He's too likable. Yeah. Not that Father Karras isn't yeah. likable, but um, Nicholson also, Eric, no, no, no. I not. say majorly no. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll talk about this more later. But like my favorite yeah. part of the movie was Damon, the, the actor uh, Jason yeah. Miller in this movie. So like I can't imagine anybody else being it. So like, could you imagine Jack Nicholson? like chewing up the scenery and that, I mean, there's just so many subtle things in this movie that, uh-huh. you know, his eyebrows would be too loud. I can't, I, I, I can't think of any movie he'd done, even his early days when easy rider and, and, uh-huh. you know, like uh, five easy pieces. Five and easy like, pieces yeah. uh, even those movies are, he's Jack. He's he always had an odd. attitude. Yeah. He had, oh, he yeah. has a, a yeah, an I, attitude about him. I don't mean a added, you know, a persona about him. Right. I can't see um, it. And no, there's no way. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. William Peter Blatty, who was involved in the production, <laughs> ended up hiring Stacy Keach. Stacy Keach was hired yeah. for this. Um, we move on. Marlon Brando for Father Marin. Hell the no. <laughs> the power of Christ compels you. Ugh, it compels you. Now, uh, Cito was, uh, again, the perfect. <laughs> yeah. Although, I, I, you know what? Max von Cito was what? 40 if yeah, he, was, not, maybe. he was very young he was very yeah he was very and they, young. they yeah. really did him dirty by making him like really old well i mean like, that's, 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 great job with it, that's dick smith i mean it looks yeah. just like he ended up looking when he was at yeah a, like, yeah it, in, it, minority, it, in minority report that's the age he should have been in the in the exorcist <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah. for for uh for the female lead we had uh considering audrey hepburn and bancroft and jane fonda Oh. For the Ellen Burstyn role, they all turned it down. They this thank God, of, you know, little uh, yeah. maybe little intense. maybe Audrey uh, Hepburn, ba- ba- and well, Bancroft, might and Bancroft. Different. I think yeah. I could see um, Audrey yeah, Hepburn. She's, a, she's too. I mean, she's done suspenseful. Like, what was that movie where she's blind? Yeah, you know, it's like the, that. It's like that thriller. Yeah, I forget. Yeah. What it's so that yeah. was you know, it was kind yeah. of a suspenseful kind of thing. She did well. Yeah. Uh, Fonda, but, no, it would have been too much like Rosemary's Baby ish yeah. type, type of. Game. No, but she was. I mean, she was a total yeah. bitch about it, from what I hear. Anyway, she was just like, "I'm not doing that that commercial trash." Yeah. And you know, yeah, well, sure, she, she was all re- in, rethinking in that her. now. Yeah. So, so then Jason Miller, who was a, a a playwright, he wrote that championship season, which was a you know, I think it won a Pulitzer Prize. This, that, and the other thing. Um. He's fr- he was friends with these with I think with Blatty or he knew him and he requested a screen test even though Keach was already hired. He mm-hmm. said you know I, with Freakin I'm sorry not with with Blatty Freakin's like well we already have Stacy Keach. It's like well can I just test for it anyway? So he let him test for it. And, and even Jason Miller said he goes I I am Karis. I I am like because he. The, Jason Miller went to study theology for a little bit and yeah. kind of had a lot of those, you know, uh, some of those traits that, that father Karras has. Uh, so Stacy Keach's contract was bought out. They paid him said, Oh, thanks. Wow. Well, that was an easy pay. Uh, you know, um, Ellen Burstyn right? was the same, same thing. She, she wanted to play Chris McNeil. She goes, I, I, well, I am this role. You know, she, she, you know, had to convince freaking, to, to hire her as well so it was She's uh, really but, good oh my god yeah. and then and then after this as a result of this film jason miller was offered the lead in a little film called taxi driver what which he turned down because he wanted to it was a play he wanted to do he it would return to the stage often and that's that was wow. his first love, that would have so. been interesting yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. Huh. So uh, I can see it, and then, but that, yeah, it's the alter- alternate universe, you know, version. <laughs> well, here's yeah. here's one more for you then in in for the uh, you know, for the role of of Reagan that Linda Blair played. Uh Denise Nickerson, does that name sound familiar? No. Violet Nick- Beauregard from Willy Wonka from the Chocolate <laughs> oh, Factory. Okay. Was up for it and uh sure. her her they turned it down. Her family read it and they said it's it's just this was just too dark. It was just too much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this woman wow. came in uh, with by the last name of Blair. I think her name is Ellen. I think uh, brought in her daughter Linda Blair, who had just done only done some modeling, uh, and I think was on one TV show or something. They brought her in, and uh, that was it. You've, that, then you've got it right. So so our cast is um, Linda Blair as Reagan. Uh, you've got the great Ellen Burstyn. Was this this was after Alice doesn't live here anymore? Right. It was. Yeah. yeah, so she had already worked with Scorsese. Uh, Ellen Burstyn as Chris McNeil, Max von Sydow as uh, Father Lancaster Marin, 
Eric, this makes three for Lee. Lee J. Cobb. Yep. Making the great his, Lee J. Cobb. Yeah, is one of his last performances as Lieutenant yep. uh, Kinderman. He does not yell in this movie, though. No, very we, understated. Uh, we but, do, yeah, we but, don't get the yelling Lee J. Cobb. We get the but very brilliant sustained. nonetheless. Yeah, yes, he, you, you want you want exactly. a piece of Lee J. Cobb trivia? Yeah. I, I think both of you will will enjoy this. Um, do you know? Do you, Andy? You know the actor Drake, James Cromwell, right? Yes. Sure. Yeah. He played, uh, you know, and he was in Star Trek First Contact and all that kind of stuff. Yep. Uh, he's married to Lee J. Cobb's daughter. That's interesting. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. See that? Anyway, back to... <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, Jason Miller as, as Father Damien Karras. Linda Blair as Reagan McNeil. Uh, everybody else is kind of, you know... Jason we, Miller has got a famous son. He's got a very know. famous son and a famous father-in-law. I don't know if... I think his father-in-law is more, fam- more famous. Oh, really? I didn't know the father-in-law. I just his father-in-law his is Jackie Gleason. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, no, I know, I know this story because I was just listening to a podcast where Jason Patrick, uh, who is, uh, you know, Michael from um, uh, The Lost Boys, is his son, uh, Karis' son in real life. Yep. And, he, and he was talking about how um, Miller, uh, you know, around that time was kind of a distant father sort of thing. But, I mean, it was even worse with... Uh, you know, uh, Jackie Gleason apparently was just uh, not not a very loving family yeah. man. Uh, apparently, so there was you know all kinds of. That's a very stories. that's very interesting because in the extended cut, um, Kinderman is they put the scene back where he's you know the priest at the end, and he's walking away, and to keep Karis's spirit alive, you know, because he be bonded with him. He was talking about, oh, I like to go to movies, father. You like you like yeah. movies, father. You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, they added that scene at the end where he fr- befriends his best friend, and he mentions Jackie Gleason. So mm-hmm. I thought wow. that was a pretty interesting. So that's a, no. So, so he's like, that might have been a little connection. Uh, yeah, freaking yeah, probably definitely an Easter. Maybe egg. he did that on purpose. Yeah, yeah. I think it was yeah. an Easter egg. Yeah. Uh, safe to say, none of us saw this in the theater. No. Upon its first release. No, we did not. I, re- I was young enough to remember the furor around it. I remember the mania, much like Jaws. Eric, do you kind of remember? Of course. I remember people talking about this. I was only seven or se- you know, seven. Yeah. Um, but I remember people, this whole thing on the news of people being terrified, people puking or oh, yeah. you know, one woman miscarried and well, taking out on stretchers and- my mom was 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 pregnant with my sister at the time, and she read the book. Wow, that well, explains she, a lot. That explains it, a yes, lot. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, Jim. And she went to see the the film with uh-huh. my dad, and uh, yeah, she she loved it. I mean, she came back, and she, my mom likes that kind of stuff anyway. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> and of course, she was telling me all about it, and then you know, she's. I said, so what's the deal with? Because I asked, I said, you know, I was like, yeah, you hear all this talk, you know, yeah. like word of mouth stuff, like people are fainting and this, and you know, and she's, and I said, what's the big deal? And she couldn't, obviously couldn't tell me some of the, yeah. the scenes, yeah. you know, in, <laughs> in, in detail. Um, but, uh, and I don't think she really knew at the time that it really wasn't the, the, uh, the, the possession moments that, that did it. It was yeah. all of the medical stuff, all of the. Yeah when Reagan goes is going under all these treatments and, and that was the horrifying aspect of people just getting sick and yeah, the, the scene with the scene with the, with yeah. the needle in her neck, with the blood, they said a lot of people <laughs> it, just, lost it just it. looks so real. It was yeah. just, yeah. you know, so shockingly, you know, like and a documentary. The, yeah. The doctor pulls the mom out into the hallway and the, and the, and the hospital and lights up a cigarette. He's like, yeah. let, me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you something. Yeah. <laughs> That's an old sure. 70s. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody was smoking. It, it, it was, it yeah. was okay back then. They did, you know, yeah. what did they know? Yeah. Andy, you, this then. is, this is one of your favorite movies of all time, right? It is. Why? Uh, <clears throat> well, I mean, I'm a huge horror movie fan and, um, I think well, on a previous podcast we I had mentioned this before that it, it was like there was it was a proper film. It wasn't a it wasn't a not that horror isn't proper film, but you know what I mean. Like it's a proper yeah. film. You have no idea if you had never heard of this movie, you had no idea what it was. You didn't know the name of the movie, and somebody handed it to you. You'd have no idea you were about to get your pants, you know, uh, blown off. But like, there's no winking or nudging or uh, that we're you know entering a horror movie. But horror, horror movies in general have that kind of structure, you know, like love love it or not. I love it very much but uh they don't 
they don't spend a lot of time dilly dallying, especially in like the mid to late eighties. It's just straight to the horror and stuff. Yeah. And so there's so many mm-hmm. scenes in this movie that are, they just weren't acting or like putting on a show. There's like intimate scenes in the, in the movie. Like when she's like tucking Reagan into bed and they're talking to each other and it's kind of love and mom daughter thing. And she like pulls a little eyelash off of her cheek. And you know, it's just, it's just like, you're, it's like you're invading their space or something. It's just like, yeah. it's, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. and it, it, there's but there's also stuff like when uh, Damien Karras goes to his mom's house and changes her bandages, and it's just these quiet moments. There's a radio playing in the background. He like pulls his collar off, and he's getting relaxed. And it's just like th- th- there's just these long scenes of just life of seeing these people, and it's just slow cooking, you know. Like and um, or even like when in, in the dorm in the in the church when um, after his mom dies, he's like drunk. And his other fellow priest like puts a cigarette in his mouth, takes his shoes off for him, puts him, tucks him in. Yeah. And it's just those little intimate moments that just, it, it's just, it adds up. It's just, like I said, that, that, that yeah, it, it, gr- it grounds the film in, yeah. you know, you know, yeah, it's not, Oh, the, you know, the five college students, they're, they're on a trip and they end up at a, right. at a house 20 minutes in. And then the, you know, the festivities begin. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you just, are getting a, a really slow roll. This is a really slow roll of a film. Yeah, uh, and, almost to the point that you forget when I'm wa- when I was watching it, I'm like, you could almost forget the whole Marin first fifteen yeah. minutes of it, like, yeah. like because because with with the with the beginning shots of Father Marin, there's virtual virtually not that there's not any, but there's virtually no dialogue. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. It's just a lot of things you see him doing a lot of things, right, and, and encountering different things, and then you cut to cut to Georgetown, and you and that is totally. Normally, that would be damaging to us to a, a movie if you did if you just kind of left that behind and didn't revisit it, you know. And and the fact that we didn't know his name, we didn't know his name was Father Marin in in the film in the beginning. So they start making references to this person. You still don't know that it's that guy because you almost forgot that he was in the movie, right? Yeah, and it's just I mean, uh, continuing with that. Um, Jason Miller's portrayal as just an everyman. Like I, I'd never heard of him in a movie before or after really outside the exorcist movies. I didn't pay attention to him that much, but he, he looked like somebody that was at like my uncle or something. He wasn't like a movie star, you know? And, um, he's, he's, he's like an everyman. And I think that the biggest thing for me too is like, and this is kind of a personal thing is that like, I was, a a youth minister for 15 years at a church. And, um, I feel like this is this movie the subplot of Marin is what I love so much about it. Cause it's like the, one of the most realistically portrayed uh, versions of somebody having a crisis of faith, like a man of faith, having a crisis of faith. And there's like the conversations between the two priests in like a noise, a noisy sports pub with like they're drinking yeah. beers and it's smoking Roman brothers it, playing in the background. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's just something you don't see in movies talking about like right. father. Yeah, and, and especially and, between two priests, which is very yeah. sort of reverential. Like they're always sort of like, stoic and and you but to see them act like real just regular people and joking with each yeah. other and ribbing right. each other and stuff and like, yeah. i remember my grandmother you know, like in the i don't god it was when i was really young so uh she once she was a very episcopal family my family and uh she once saw the priest uh with tennis shoes on and she <laughs> she talked about that decades later <laughs> <laughs> like, do you remember? Do you know that there was a time that I saw him with shoes on? And I'm like, yes, you know, yeah. So, like, could you imagine though, like, somebody in the in '73, like the religious yeah. folks of the time, seeing two priests sitting over a table with beers, talking about crisis of faith and that sort of stuff or whatever? It's got to make you uncomfortable immediately, anyway. Much less the whole possession part, but it's just yeah. it's just this like yeah. little window into life, you know. And then you know, there's just the stuff with. Uh, his mom, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. Damien Karras' mom, and it's just like you can feel the pain in his in his soul, yeah. you know. Like, oh, you—he just... looks like a man that's haunted in this film. Yeah. I mean, he just looks yeah. like a man that is carrying something on him. Like you can tell, like he just looks worn down. He looks world weary, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's, you know, right, Eric? It's, it's kind of yeah. has like that that look of of yeah, like it's. Well, he doesn't have to say much to 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 get it. No, it looks like he's yeah. he's going through. He's got this crisis of faith, but also the, the, all the stuff with his mom. And plus the fact that, you know, it's interesting to note that both Marin and Karis, they all have, they have a different job too. You know, Marin's an archaeologist, you know, and, and Karis is a psychologist as well. Yeah. So a lot of, hearing a lot of people's problems and people who probably aren't 
that religious or of uh, have faith, you know, and having to hear just the real world problems of somebody just coming in and just dumping their stuff on him. And it's, uh, and so, yeah, he he looks very fatigued, very, you know, he's ready to just lay down, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, yeah, it's just so well portrayed and so, and just the physical, you know, the body language and everything is just, yeah, he's also a boxer. He used to be a boxer. So he, right. He goes out, right. You know, he goes out running and he, and he, he goes to the, the boxing gym and, uh, you know, so yeah, the, the, you're seeing a different side of of it, it. Kind of humanizes at the time. Yeah, that these priests, while they're they are holy men, uh, not infallible. They have problems. They have they question as as much as anybody else. You mm-hmm. know, it, it was just um, it's absolutely yeah. brilliant to to write him as a psychologist because when he has the conversation about like, you know, he she said she was Satan's. Might as well be saying that she's Napoleon Bonaparte. Like yeah. it's he's downgrading. The, the possibility of spiritual possession. It's just like, I've seen a million psychopaths. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. so yeah. it's just, and to like a, a, a cheaper movie would portray him as like a holy man, like no, know, knowing immediately, I know immediately this is, you know, a, yeah. a spiritual it's Satan's work. And well, you know, it's not like right. that at all. He go, he does everything that he can to, you know, squash the, yeah, he, he, he was like looking at it from, a, from, yeah. from yeah. a clinic. He was looking at it from a clinical standpoint, right? He was yeah. looking at it as a psychiatrist or a psychologist saying, yeah, like this doesn't, this doesn't pass the sniff test. It seems like this is more of a mental, a mental concern than yeah. a spiritual yeah. concern, you know? So yeah, that's, that's a really good point that he's bringing science, right? Psychology yeah. or psychiatry into, into the field of spiritualism. And, and that, that might've been where some of the, crisis of of faith and him doubting kind of comes in it's because he he basically says like, I, I can't do this anymore and then it's the it's like, just, you know. and then it's the scientists the the uh the people at the hospital the ones that are re- recommending the exorcism so it's yeah. like they're, they're overlapping <laughs> they're like we got nothing left yeah <laughs> right yeah you know exactly. saint joseph saint joseph baby aspirin maybe no yeah oh go go to the you know so um yeah and, and this kind of you know th- this movie does really take its time mm-hmm. even even with with linda blair you know you, you don't really know what's there's not any indications that, that there's going to be something going on with her really kind of you know first it's like there's rats upstairs and you kind of don't know what's going on and what does it mean and yeah you yeah. know things are they're creepy things are happening but um it, it's just uh, then there's a murder right and i think that's really what kicks things off is when burke you know was Dennis. supposed to go go yeah. go you know Go check on uh, the director. Yeah, check she on, comes on home Reagan. And she, she thinks that she was left alone, and yeah. and he was there. But that's and the fact that you don't see it yeah. happen. He's at the and bottom she, of the stairs. She drives up and she sees everybody, mill, you know, around the right, bottom of the stairs. <laughs> but you don't actually see that happen, and that's what makes it all the more eerie, in the sense, you know, yeah. like. And then uh, uh, one of my favorite scenes is when the cop comes, you know, when, when Lee J. Cobb comes to yeah. talk to uh, Ellen Burstyn and, and it's just, he's kind of like Columbo in that yeah. sense where he's like trying to charm her. And he's like, you know, he's like, one he, more thing. he knows <laughs> he know he's like, he's just, you know, obviously he's like, and he's talking through yeah. it, but he doesn't actually say it. He doesn't actually say, make any accusations or, you know, yeah. there's no, you know, but he knows like this is, this doesn't add up. Your daughter was the only one in the room the only one that could have done this and he just doesn't you know he he can't say it like it you know and it's oh i just think that's such a great scene so if you know yeah. that's probably going to be one of my favorite scenes if we do talk when, about when they're drinking coffee yeah. when they're sitting at the table drinking the yes coffee. and then she yeah. asks him and that's what's so brilliant too is that that little added moment where she asks him would you like another cup of coffee because that typically again in any other film, he would have been like, Oh, I think that's it. I think that I got everything. So yeah. let me go. But no, he, no, yeah, I'll have another cup of coffee. So yeah. it adds more attention to the scene. Yeah. She's like, she's got yeah. that look on her face. She's trying to get rid of him, yeah. you know, and he just takes one yeah. sip and he's like, All right, I think I got what yeah. I came for. <laughs> you know, can I get an autograph but, for my daughter? Yeah. yeah. What's, yeah. What, what's her name? Uh, well, it's actually for me. Lieutenant. And that, uh, and Lee J. I mean, he's just so good in that scene. It's just so, yeah. so, it's such an understated performance, but so, so well done. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, the, the, the realness, the thing that I keep coming back to, there's the, the shot um, at the very beginning when you see Ellen Burson's character behind the scenes about preparing herself yeah. for a shot. Yeah. You see her like, push her shirt down and she's you know like 
loosening up and like walking up to her queue and all this stuff or whatever. It's just, it, it, it's just a, it's a, that whole set piece, you know, is like, there's a huge college rally and all this stuff or whatever, you know, it's just, and then you um, see the people talking behind the scenes and stuff. You just, I just, I keep comparing this to the stuff that I really, really like. Like I love mid to late eighties horror movie. Cause it's just so, so cheesy and schlocky and stuff. Mm-hmm. They never spend time on that kind of stuff and it never feels uh-huh. big. It always feels very intimate, you know, or, you know, you're this part yeah. of the woods, somebody's getting murdered or something. But, you know, it just feels so like um, old Hollywood, the, you know, yeah, the old, a, bit, you know, a, big, the a old, little bit of bigger scale. The old, yeah. uh, the only intimate scenes are just people getting laid in the, <laughs> in yeah. the corner, you know, yeah. the teenagers getting it on. That's and that's not, pretty I'm much. Not the exo- I think you're talking you know, about the exorcist. I'm like, oh, oh no, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm talking about like referring to the, the horror third, movies. Is there a third cut? Yeah. Andy, yeah. you mentioned, you mentioned that scene where, where Ellen Burstyn was. And I thought about it today when I was watching, I'm like, this is very meta because it's an actress pretending to be an actress, pretending to, to go and do a scene. I'm like, this is actually very like yeah. meta. Uh, on different levels because and, and people are trying to like like fix her collar and she's like shooing him away because she's like trying yeah. to walk through to, to mm-hmm. get to her mark and everything uh ellen burston was just fantastic i mean yeah. you see the change she's carefree she's an actress she's got her help the maids take care of it and yeah you know the, the great relationship where you know reagan takes the cookie and she tackles her and they're they're tickling and you know and then, and she just totally kind of become someone that's totally broken and just to- totally at-, at her wit's end for all for her daughter. She wants to know what's going on, you know, and, and yeah. not, not getting the answers, not getting, or, or she's getting answers, but they're not, they're not the right answers. You yeah. Know? Have you heard the story about the tension between freaking and person during the filming? Like, Oh yeah. Actually yeah. hurt her, you know, like yeah. I, I think yeah, she, of- yeah, she got hurt. A lot of the actors in general were just really kind of, just kind of pissed off in general with freaking because he would have a, a gun full of blanks and mm-hmm. uh, they would be in the middle of a take, you know, like uh, during the exorcism. And he would yeah. just shoot the gun and people, everybody on the set would jump and, they're, to get and they'd, it, they'd, yeah. they'd finish the scene, but they'd be like, stop doing, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, there's the scene where, you know, Reagan slaps her across the room or whatever. And, uh, you know, they had her tied to a, a something around her waist and somebody was yanking her backwards and they did it a couple of time, a couple, couple, you know, takes and it just wasn't what he wanted. So she said famously that she saw the corner of her eye, uh, freaking, uh, like talk to the, or like make a head nod or something toward the guy yeah, to like do really it. yank it, do it hard. And, uh, she, they just yanked him. She had, she had like spinal damage or something. Yeah, for she, like, some well, she did. Yeah. yeah she yeah. Did, heard it back, but the doctor said, it's not, it's not, it's only temporary. So thank God. But you right. know, like that would, yeah, yeah he was doing things was that cool. he would never get away with today. Yeah. I mean, the fact yeah. that he slapped the priest at the end and the guy that played his best friend was not an actor. I mean, yeah. he was a priest. Yeah. And he's trying to give the last rites and he, and it's freezing and it's like two in the morning and he's trying, and that's that famous story about freaking just you trust me and he's like yeah and he just slaps him across the face when he's giving him the, yeah when he's when giving, he's giving the him the rights and, and that's why you Harris. know you see him crying that's a that's a real reaction yeah, he that is, on him. he's not acting there yeah. <laughs> and his hand is shaking and it's like you know it just rattled him but he was a, you know, like ellen Burstyn said he, he's just freaking was just a maniac you know brilliant yeah. director but a maniac <laughs> it's just like yeah so there's no way he could get away with that kind of yeah. shit today, but there were, yeah, a lot of, just, there were a lot of real priests in the movie too. I think yeah, uh, yeah. was was his name Tom? Uh, the other one, the one that he had a beer with. I think he was a real priest as well. And yeah, I think yes, uh, the the older uh, guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, him and and then the best friend. Um, yeah. I don't know if the 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 head of the of the school was though. He might have yeah, been. Yeah, fa- Father <clears throat> Tom. He was Tom. Uh, <clears throat> Thomas Bur- Birmingham is Father Tom yeah. Canavan. Mm-hmm. He's the president of Georgetown University. Um, <clears throat> yeah, pretty- a lot, a lot of, a lot of realism, right? Really, kind of going, you know. And I'm surprised that the priests, you know, I'm surprised that the church let them let them be in a film like this too, you know, of, of this nature. Because it was also they're kind of talking about, well, you know, the church doesn't really do, ex- you know, in the film, we you know we, we don't really do exorcisms anymore. It's something that's kind of old. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, old I hat the, and the, <clears throat> the nature of that, right? The, I mean, this whole story is based on a, a, a supposed true, true story, which happened in Georgetown in 1949. And so Blatty got the idea that he wrote a story, you know, the book, 
and then Freakin was investigating that as well, and, and all these other like sort of other cases, and and so he's like, this could be really interesting. I'd like to do this, and he he was blown away by. The, I think he was on a press tour for French Connection, and he read the book in like one night and he couldn't put it down. He's like, because because Blatty had wanted him to direct it. I think I don't. I can't even imagine who else might have been chosen yeah. for this. But well, uh, in, in John hands- Borman, John Borman was up for it at the time. He would do the Exorcist too, but he was yeah. up for it. Uh, for- oh God! Actually, they asked, approached him. He said, "Nah, I'm not interested." But then he was interested in doing the, the second one. Right. Just because you dared to speak its name, I'll comment on how bad the second movie was. Go ahead. But- and Scorsese <laughs> loved it. Scorsese think- freaking loves that movie. Like he's, he's a, he is a big proponent for the second. I'm like, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, lo- loves that and hates Marvel movies. Good job. Yeah. Al. Um, so the second one was horrible. The third one is one of the best sequels to a movie ever made. Uh, the Exorcist three with yeah. uh, w- with Jason they bring Miller. back Jason Miller. Yeah, yeah, and, um, and George C. Scott playing Kinderman. Kinderman. Like they bring yeah. the cop back. You know, and uh, yeah, worm, worm, cream of worm tongue. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like it's, it's, I love that movie. I absolutely love the third movie. It's so good. Have you guys seen it? No, yeah, I haven't. Oh, uh, highly recommend, highly recommend. Just wow. it, it's a, it's a direct sequel to the first movie. Yeah. So, um, Vladdy yeah. directed it. He, he, he wrote the story. It's based on Legion, which yeah, was book. a sequel story, yeah. but he actually directed the film too as well. Yeah. So not bad. He didn't do a bad job. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, <clears throat> half, half he he for Exorcist three he half heartedly was a, was approaching directors and they I, I forgot who he approached about it. Oh, John Carpenter, and John Carpenter's like I could tell that he really wanted to direct it himself, mm-hmm. you know, and it wasn't I wasn't interested. You know, there was no there was no exorcism at the end of the original script, and I, they made him reshoot it. They made him. It, I think the studio was like, "There's no, there's got to be an exorcism at the end of this." You can't mm. not, it's not have it. really. So they, so they kind of shoehorned in a story. They threw a priest in there and they shoehorned in the story. But uh, Blatty wanted to direct it from the beginning. It seems like. Yeah, like they they wanted. well they, uh, they no. there's two versions of that film as well, I believe. And I mean, the movie is not it's not really tied. I mean, it has it has something to do with the first one, but not really. I mean, it's more yeah. it has it's its own thing. And it's, it's in the it's, same it's, universe as it. Yeah, you know, and uh, it's it's a uh, really good like uh, procedural like you know, yeah. good detective story. It's a, it's a really good thriller like that, you know, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought it was great. So ba- yeah. back to the original, um, mm-hmm. one of the things I caught in the very beginning, uh, and it wasn't too subtle, uh, which would be a foreshadowing is when, when Marin gets called, uh, he's in Iraq, he's, he's on the dig and they find, uh, you know, they find a little, little trinket or whatever. Uh, and then he finds the statue of Pazuzu and he's standing on one side of the screen and Pazuzu is mm-hmm. on the other side, you know, de- telegraphing a face off eventually, you know, which, which again, you almost forget about because the movie just moves on from him and never gets mentioned again. But then he kind of, Oh, father, you know, father Marin. Yeah, he's back. He's in Iraq. Oh, he's back. You know? So, you know, they kind of, kind of brought him back in. You kind um, of get the impression that he's, quite aware of Suzuzu. Like when he sees the statue or yeah. the, the thing, the, oh, yeah. the, the, the artifact, it's like, Oh boy, here we go. Um, but I mean, that whole intro scene, I mean, like the, the, the sound mixing, you know, the Oscar winning sound mixing, they, they mixed in the sound of bees and like yeah. this, uh, low resonance hum or something like that, that mm-hmm. makes, that will make people uncomfortable to begin with. So the people in the theater were reacting to the sound without even know they were reacting. They were already getting sick just at the beginning of the movie by, yeah. they're like, you know, subliminally screwing with people yeah. at the beginning of the movie, which yeah. is awesome. Now, 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 here's one of my questions. Either one of you can answer it. Mm-hmm. Um, in in the very beginning, when he gets called, when he gets called to the uh, to the dig, and he finds that little artifact, Andy, that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. First, they find a medallion, right? Yeah. And the guy says, "It's not. This is not. This is too new. It's not from that same era." Yeah. yeah. So, well, so well, what? Can someone tell me what? Th- this is my genuine question because I, I, you know, what did that mean? Well, uh, in the original, uh, there was no, uh, it was supposed to be one of those Pulp Fiction briefcase sort of things. Uh, it was you a know, MacGuffin. It's up to you. However, they did a, the, the prequel movie with, what's his name? I can't remember. Ellen Skarsgård. Yeah, yeah. Playing younger Marin. Yeah. And they somehow like worked that in to where that was part of the story in the prequel. And it was that, it was just so dumb. Yeah. It's just, there's something, there's, there's a trope 
Um, okay, so like here's what here's what was so great also about the Exorcist. Okay, she is over time uh, degrading. Like she's got she's like yeah. she's got scrapes on her face because she's self harming. You know, mm-hmm. she's like you know do, this demon is ravaging this kid. You know, and now whenever there is a uh, any kind of possession story in a movie they immediately have to contort which is ridiculous and uh, then two they immediately get scars on their face for no reason it's just like yeah. you you go from perfectly good kid to turns head real quick and there's scars all of a sudden and she just starts <laughs> and she just starts breaking and contorting and you know Cirque du Soleil doing, doing the robot yeah so I, it's just I I can't watch possession horror movies anymore no. because it's all the same <laughs> and formula. none of them and none of them hold a candle none of, and yeah. the reason yeah. I mean, they did. Dick Smith did all these makeup tests with like, like witch type makeup yeah. and stuff, and it looked horrible. And freaking just said, he's like, "No, this is. It has to show. It has to lend itself to the psych, psychological aspect. When the when the doctors are saying that this is psychological, it's got to it's got to be believable that she could she's actually doing this to herself. Yeah, yeah. the whole she crucifix really scene." Uh, the masturbation scene was it's not only is she doing that but she's also those scars are from the cross yeah her cutting her face as well you don't see it but that's you know that's what's happening there and getting back to the the metal yes because i do have another question about it so freaking said that it is meant to be because there's no earthly business for that metal to be there yeah in that dig it's a foreshadowing of when the you know by the end of the film you see because Damien has the same metal. has the same metal. Has it, no, well, he's wearing it around his yeah. neck. I, was, I don't know if it's supposed to be the same metal. Yeah. How did it get there? It doesn't, it's not, they don't explain it, but it's meant to be sort of a, a, a premonition type of thing. It's a foreshadowing. Huh. Uh, okay. You know, so you keep it like, you know, so, you know, and in the extended cut, when, when she hands his, when she hands the, the metal to the other priest, yeah. his uh, father Dyer, his best friend, um, the original, they just pull, you know, he takes it and they pull away in the extended cut. She, he ends up giving it back to her. Yeah. He goes, you, you, you know, no, you, I'd like you to have it. And so they, and then they drove drive off, so, you know, yeah. to, to give the, it's in her possession now. And I wonder if that's going to factor in, in the upcoming sequel that, yeah. Yeah. you know, that uh, David Gordon Green is working on, which is going to be a trilogy apparently. <laughs> We saw what he did with Halloween. I, I, I really don't have any interest in it. But, yeah. yeah, they're trying to sell it because Ellen Burstyn's back, trying oh, to make really? it like, yeah, because like, like yeah. Jamie that, Lee that, Curtis yeah, came back. Yeah, I was going to say, for, that, that's like getting Jamie Lee Curtis back for Halloween. I mean, Ellen Burstyn yeah, didn't want movies, nothing to do with the second one. Those movies sucked. You know? Those, they were horrible. Yeah. Did they've you been see trying that? Get, that's interesting. They've been trying to get Ellen Burstyn for decades. Yeah. So she, I don't know if she's just out of money or if she Yeah, found, she probably needs, you know. <laughs> but... But I mean, so just to really quick, I mean, when, to, to answer your question about the medallion, it's sure. just like, it's that thing that modern storytellers now have to answer when we yeah. don't need answers. It's like in solo, that's right. like, that's where he got the gun. That's where he gets the vest. That's where that's he right. gets Chewbacca. That's where, you know, it's just, uh, it, it was. Okay. So when they did the prequel, it was like, we got to answer all these questions. And yeah, stuff. It's and one it, of those it, things that just, it, right. It doesn't need explaining and, and it yeah. adds to the, the, the sort of mythos and the whole mystery of the thing. And, and what is it, what is it, what does it really mean? It's a, it's, it yeah. is literally a talisman or, or a medallion for yeah. good yeah. Interesting. Okay. to represent good, you know, in that. In See, that I had a, I had a genuine question. I'm like, okay, where, you know, cause they, they yeah. made a point to say it, this is not from the same time period as all this other yeah. stuff in the dig. So, mm-hmm. uh, interesting. Let's talk about the score or lack thereof of score. There's only 17 minutes of score in this film. Yeah. Uh, that means a, a lot, a large part and probably 90% of the film, no music. Well, not only that, but just an assault on the senses, the scene after the, uh, you know, the crucifix scene and like she gets smacked across the room and it's like, ah, it's silence. Like just shot of the door. So yeah. it's just like, it's just <laughs> chaos, chaos, chaos. And then silence, you know, and it, and that's so jarring. And it happens a lot in the movie where crazy things are happening. And then you're just stuck with your own thoughts. Them sit, the two of them sitting on the, the staircase, you know, it, mm-hmm. it just, I love that. It was so, do, do you so think that attention. adds to the realism that there isn't a score telling you when something's happening or building yeah. a violin oh, building up, yeah. you know, that, that Tensions. there's, there's no, yeah, there's nothing. So it's like, you're in the room, you're hearing the door slam, you're hearing the wind blowing through. 
Uh, and you're yeah. not getting musical cues to tell you something's going to happen. You know, they're building, you know, they're, it's coming to a crescendo. Yeah. Um, you know, th- th- when, when you consider the scene where Marin shows up right at the door and he walks into the house and then it's like, it's just like quiet whispers. Like, you know, I'm father Marin and blah, blah. And all of a sudden you hear Marin, <laughs> you know, like the demon yeah. just screams. I mean, that in itself is like, yeah. A piece of music hitting you, like slapping you across the face, uh, and it, it wouldn't—it well, I mean, wouldn't like, have worked. It had there been like a, dun, dun, like a tension yeah. building type of theme happening there, you know. But uh, one of yeah. the greatest, one of the greatest commercials for the Catholicism that you can possibly—I mean, like <laughs> everyone, all the all the religious people at the, of the time were, you know, like uh, what was it a, um. Oh, the the famous preacher at the time said that the devil lives in the celluloid of the film. Um, Frank, uh, Billy Graham. Billy Graham yeah. said that like the devil lived in the celluloid. Uh, <laughs> so, but I'm like, you don't need a better commercial for you know, for yeah. Christianity than this movie. They're yeah. practically Jedi's, uh, <laughs> you know, coming in and like trying to trying to take out the Sith, you know. So it's, I don't know. Um, <laughs> No, I, it's you're, you're it's literally true. there's a lot. It's a, it's a literal. I mean, it's, I don't think there's yeah, like Andy said, I don't think there's a better example of, of a just good <sighs> versus evil. You know, yeah. it's just depicted in such a way that it's just it's just so identifiable. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's a, it's a literal. Yeah, it's a literal you way. Know? It is you know the good of of God or or whatever your opinion is on that of spirituality versus right. the evil of of the devil of Satan of temptation. Right? Because because that's what. Uh, that's what uh, you know. Uh, Pazuzu plays on. If, if you notice in the film, in, in the beginning, when the exorcism starts, Marin says to Karis, "Like this is psychological. Like he's, you know, he's going to try and 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 pl- and mess with your mind. It's not a physical thing." Yeah. And and that's exactly what Pazuzu kept doing. Marin, like I, I it never really went up against Marin. Like the 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 devil never really tried to get into Marin's head, I think because he knew it was too strong, but he knew, but the devil knew yeah. that Karis was the weak one. And that's why he kept on, on going in on the, the whole mother thing, the whole mother thing kept on hammering with him, but never really did anything to Marin. Right. This, well, I mean the shot of, um, Karis coming into the room, dead silence coming into the room and his mom sitting on the bed. Mm-hmm. I gave, gave me, gave, gave me goosebumps just saying it. Like every, the first time I saw that, it was just like my stomach sank because like you're, you're expecting to see something and you see his mom there, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, one of the, it, yeah. It takes you back scene. to, it recalls the, you know, that scene in, the, in, in, when you um, see his mother, when he's coming up the stairs of the subway. Right. Yeah. And you see that yeah. and there's complete silence there yeah, as well. The dream. Yeah. 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 I, and it's why and, you do this to me, Demi. It's it's interesting to note that Freakin also said that there's a there's a motif happening there of of um Karis ascending. There's like three shots in the movie where you see him either walking upstairs or there like he, there's a, a shot of him getting up from you know uh from being crouched on the floor or whatever. And it's like, there's like all these like shots of him, like looking up or ascending to, And then of course at the end him, his spirit ascending yeah. to, you know, when he sacrifices himself, you know, when he's looking up at the ceiling, when the demon comes into him and he's just, and then he dives out the window. The, the, the like, interesting you know, thing about that scene when, when he saw his mother at the subway, yeah. when they showed him, he was wearing like the sweatshirt that he wears when he works out at the gym, but he was wearing the priest like pants below, like almost like the duat, you know, that, that even yeah. in his mind, he was conflicted and split. He was half yeah. this, this guy that does these things and, and half a priest, you know? So it, it was a literal translation of, of his crisis also. Mm-hmm. Which um, kind of, kind of sad, but kind of cool. Or I, I might be looking way too far into this, but depending uh-huh. on whatever your flavor of, of Christianity is, uh, the, the belief is that if you, are filled with the Holy Spirit, a demon can't come in. So spending the entire movie showing Damien losing his faith, um, it's that's how he was able to pull it in, mm-hmm. you know, and then he ultimately dies, which is just sad. Like, so it's it's not there's there's a, a way to look at it where it's just it's kind of a sad ending where it's like you know that he never got his faith back mm-hmm. because he he was able to pull the demon in and he died that way. So I don't know. I don't know. Think, well, do you think did, did he though? I mean, there's there's a moment there. Like that's interesting because there's a moment there where he, the demon comes into him, but then his eyes go back to normal. 
So did yeah. he, was he, what well, did he cast the demon out right before he, and sacrificed no, I think he, I think he, because I think the he, demon had, you know, no other vessel to go into because yeah. that's when he killed himself. I think, so, I mean, it was his, it was his greatest sacrifice. So I think that was his yeah. coming to, you know, understanding that, yeah, you, you need to be, a, if you're going to win this battle, you need to be a full on believer. So and I think yeah, when yeah. he was saying, come, you know, come to me, come to me. Yeah. It was almost like a, almost like a, like a, uh, a ruse or a subterfuge. Like he came right. into him and then he dove out the window and was given his last rights. And I, you know, yeah. and you see how he's like, he was squeezing, squeezing yeah. father Dyer's hand when he's saying, do you mm. hear me? And you know, that's all you got out of that, out of, out of the final performance was, it was the squeezing of the hand. And um, yeah. yeah, I think it was, I, I think the sacrifice was kind of his redemption. It was kind of like, he understood like, you know, cause he, he could have just walked out and said, you know what? the hell with all this I'm, i don't believe it anyway <laughs> right so yeah. but he came after seeing yeah. all this stuff and then seeing what happened to marin yeah that kind of yeah. that kind of brought that kind of pushed him over the edge a little bit so there was a little bit of probably of human anger but then also spiritual i think after after having that whole thing happen i just so love, let me let me let me ask this oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go, i'm sorry i just they were no, just okay. like you know, one of you i think it was andy <clears throat> mentioned the, the scene where they're sitting on the stairs and he's asking why her why this little girl and they're like yeah. i just love that uh, the whole point is that, like just human beings, this demon just considers them trash. They're just, you were never, you know, and God, if, 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 if human beings are this messed up, this conflicted, where there's a, just a very thin line of good and evil, uh, no God would want to love you. And that's what he's trying to like, you know, put on people. It's like, I, yeah. I it's just, you know, chilling to think about in that, in that respect. But, you know, uh, yeah, so it's, yeah. So, yeah. so let me ask another question and maybe, maybe to each one of you can answer it, but what, what is this film ab about to you? Is this film about an exorcism mm. or what, you know, what, Andy, what is this film about to you? Uh, cause it's very easy to say, Oh, it's the exorcist. And, and she's, she's throwing up on people and the head spinning. And it's like, yeah, that those are parts of the film. But it I only makes this, up a very small yeah. part of the film, honestly. Yeah, I think this this in my mind, this story is about Damien Karras. And I he's oh. you know, and the things that are surrounding him, his crisis of faith, his ascension, you know, his ultimately having a crisis and then, you know, sacrificing himself after believing again, that sort of stuff. But I mean, like there it's not that's the main story, but it, it all comes down to good versus evil. I think it's just a like a uh -huh. um like a classic good versus evil sort of thing, you know, it, 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 what's pretty interesting to me is, is I've, I've got friends who never saw it when they were kids and have grown up uh, and are now, you know, atheists and stuff like that. And they've seen this movie and they're laughing the entire movie. Like it, it just doesn't affect them at all. Like it, it just, yeah. if, you, if you think it's a fairy tale to begin with and you didn't have the scare when you were a kid, yeah. Seeing, seeing it now, it's just like, this is what you all like sort of, you know, so, uh, uh but I, it, it's a, it's a classic good versus evil story to me, uh, but it's, you know, around uh, Eric Harris. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, I think, well, it's, it is, it's all about, uh, the question or the mystery of faith, you know, cause I mean, you know, you, you look at, uh, Ellen Burstyn too. I mean, her, it's, it's partly her story as well. I mean, cause she doesn't believe. You know, she's not overly Christian, you know, in the film and she, you know, has to, I mean, she's forced to believe, I think. And it, and it just sort of, I mean, especially at the end, I think it's poignant that he does hand the medal back to her. Does she go on to believe? Is yeah. she just going to go back to her life and just as if nothing happened? Who's to say, you know, we don't know that. I guess we'll find out. But, uh, but yeah, and to me, just the way they approach the whole question of faith is just to me the whole it it's it elevates the film to something completely more than just the simple horror film. Mm -hmm. It's the jarring moments that are so so surreal that make you think, yeah, it's very laughable at this stuff, but when you consider the realism of everything else, yeah. those, when those scenes happen, it's like you're just kind of like reacting as they're reacting. So you know, like some people laugh at it. Some people, you know, are just or are, are terrified by it or freaked out by well, it. I mean, it's just it's it, it evokes those emotional. So is it is this more of a know, is this more of a drama with a really, I think so with with a yeah. really messed up ending like yep. I think you know so. yeah. because because of the pace that it takes and because so much time is spent on character building. 
you know, yeah, yeah we yeah. we learn about a lot about Ellen Burstyn's character, Chris, and you know, again, like her home life and what's that like the 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 absence of the father, um, and yeah, and 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 it kind of switches back and forth. Then we then we spend a little time with with Father Karras and uh, relationship with his mother and how that's kind of damaged, or he's got guilt about not not being there for her. So, um, I mean, if you took out the ex- if you took out the end of the movie, you would pretty much have a character study. You would have a character drama about two people. You know, yeah. you just change the ending where they kind of uh, help each other through their problems, and it's it's just a straight up drama. Or Reagan gets some right? psychological help. You yeah, know, and, like you know, right. like yeah, yeah. L- like like you could have this. This could be a straight up drama. Like, there's nothing about this that couldn't have been rewritten or reconfigured into a into a straight up drama by changing changing that one thing about that that it had to be an exorcism, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So it actually it actually you know everybody kind of really kind of keys in on, on all those scenes with, with Linda Blair. And she was, fan, no, you know, nothing short of fantastic as well for a, well, she like uh 14 or 13 at the time. I, made it the I would argue, I time. would argue this probably hands down for me, one of the be- very best child acting yeah. performances. Cause I mean, you know, you see like old shows when they have like little Clint Howard on Star Trek and he's yeah. like talking with a, with a, with a, you know, mature voice, and you could tell he's just mouthing the words uh, and yeah. it doesn't quite match. But when she is talking in her, like uh, Karis's mother's voice, uh, yeah. she's acting that out. You see Why like the, the, the words are just coming and, and her, the way her, the look on her face, it's such a mature performance. Yeah. It, it, yeah. This is well, not a 14 year old girl, you know, like it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Speaking speaking of which, there's a famous story as well that uh, that Jason Miller likes to tell that um, <laughs> that she you know she was 13 or 14 when she's filming, and they uh, uh, Von Cedal's very first day on set, uh, they go into the room or whatever, and they're like, "All right, ready, action! Your mother sucks cocks in hell," <laughs> and and, and, and Cedal goes, "Excuse me, cut." <laughs> <laughs> So he, he's I, guess he a, I guess he only read his lines. <laughs> yeah, he's such a. <laughs> but, uh, Somebody, but having actors of his cal, I mean, in something yeah. like this too, it's like you know, of yeah. course, like Alec Guinness and Star Wars, and yeah. it just add, it just, I don't know, it just elevates it to that. And there's, they have, they're such classy people, you yeah. know. It's just, it's, it adds that, yeah, something See, to it, you know. Like it just, yeah. Well, that was. Seems- like Andy makes a good point. Like you, you Andy you referenced the, the horror films of the eighties a lot, but back in the seventies, either something was schlock, like really schlocky and low yeah. budget yeah. or it wasn't, you know? And the, yeah. so in the eighties, you kind of was, were, were kind of splitting the difference of you had high budget stuff, but it just had, d- didn't have a lot of meat on the bones. It's like, yeah, let's get the kids in trouble. Let's get the chainsaws out. Let's get and the they knew what out, they were you know? doing. I mean, these guys were making these kinds of movies and they knew what they were doing. We're not, you know, they're sure. not trying to do anything yeah. different. You know, in the seventies, uh, you know, a lot of these directors were trying to be, let's face it, trying to be auteurs. They were like, yeah. this, like yeah. freaking and spill. Like you could make the case of Spielberg with jaws too. Is it really about the shark? No, huh. it's about these three guys and, you know, dealing with, you know, the, the, what's happening to Amity and all that stuff. There's subtext and, you know, all this kind of stuff going on. Everybody's trying to be smarter than what the movie should be, but it's yeah. actually much, much more smarter than that. It's, you know what I mean? Like there's just a lot of that happening in that, around that time with these guys and just, you know, I, but, I got uh, one, I got one more thing before we sure. go. I, don't, I, I know that we're running up on time, but um, ah, we're fine. The, the scene <laughs> where um, Reagan um, is talking about, she saw a pony. You know, she's mm-hmm. like, oh, and it was so, God, mom, can we get a pony? You know, yeah. it was, it didn't feel like a kid saying, I would like a pony, you know, like trying to act. It felt like the camera was, somebody turned the camera on while she was talking yeah. uh, between scenes or something like that. She was amazing. And I've got to meet Linda Blair a couple of times at Spooky Empire. And the last, <laughs> the last time there's like a VIP party with a bar and there's like free drinks. And then there's a stage where they give like raffles and play music and DJ and that sort of stuff. Everybody's there and everybody's getting drunk and having, a, I don't know. I'm sorry if I told this story before, but uh, everybody's having a great time. And uh, she goes up on stage and she's like, you know, like Linda Blair just goes up to the stage, grabs a microphone, like doesn't even ask, just goes and grabs a microphone. And she's like, uh, 
while you guys are sitting here drinking, and I forgot exactly what she said, but she's like, while you guys are sitting here drinking, many pit bulls all over the world are dying. Huh. And I just think that you guys need to know that, you know, she like berates the audience <laughs> for, for, for like, you know, chastising. Because she, <laughs> she owns a pit bull uh, rescue uh. somewhere. And uh, she's just <laughs> chastising everybody for having a good time and drinking. And then she's like, and, and, and that's it. Go ahead and keep drinking then and put some microphone up. And everybody just mm-hmm. kind of, Turns back to their drinks and mic, okay. mic drop. <laughs> but um, what was the, what was the scariest part of the movie for you guys? Ooh, I I don't think the exorcism. I think the stuff leading up to it, just the, the creepiness of everything that was happening, without knowing. Right again, when you're watching yeah. it for the first time, you you just don't know wh- where it's leading. You know, and and you know, Linda Blair was so good at portraying, just being in pain, like just before she was fully possessed, like, like shaking up and down and, and, you know, just be, being in pain. And, um, that was, that was scary. But what was probably the scariest thing for me, wasn't necessarily a scene, but it was when, when Marin and Karis go into the room to confront the devil, you can see their breath. Yeah. Yeah. That was like a whole other level of like whole, like, like that, and that, and they did that practically. They had they yeah, bitching, they they air conditioned the crap out of that thing, so it, it you know so they could drop the temperature. And what an effect when when they're in there, they're saying the prayers, and mm-hmm. you know you see the their breath, <clears throat> and that's just cre- to me that's like just creepy stuff. I'm like Jesus, you know, like it really sets like like it's got to be ice cold in that room, and it's just like fall, it's autumn, and you know in in the movie. And, uh, so yeah, it was more the atmospheric stuff than something that was outright. Yeah, scary. <clears throat> Eric, what do you what do you got? I'll, I'll agree. Um, uh, the sound design, mm-hmm. I think, is what gets me now. Yeah, uh, it's no longer the the creepy makeup, the Captain Howdy face, the subliminal, you know, yeah. which is effective. But uh, but I think it's more the sound design is what is what really gets under my skin at this point. Even the beginning, which I think is a great opening to any film, um, but. But like you were saying, like the the underlying sound effects, and then, then all of a sudden he's on standing on the mountain. You see the dogs fighting in the distance, and it's just yeah, what's real? What's happening here? And it's you know something ominous is on its way. Yeah. And it's just and just the idea of this thing in Iraq just happens to pick this little girl who's all the way on the other side of the world. You know, it's like just it's so random. It's just yeah. like you start thinking like, wow, it could just anybody could just be just you could just drop in and, you know, but I think Karis had a lot to do with that as well. I think and maybe because Marin was at this at that point in upstate New York, perhaps he was closer. Maybe the proximity of all these characters together is what prompted, uh, you know, the demon to to possess her, you know, but whatever. But, it, you know, but that's just the idea of that really creeps me out is the fact that it's just so completely random. Do, do you yeah, think no. do you think Spielberg stole a little of the beginning of this for for Raiders of the Lost Ark? In watching okay. the beginning, I'm kind of it, I was totally recalling like the Well of the Souls and the Dig. Oh yeah, like the kid running through like the different like because they had all those those trenches and everybody's working and all the pickaxes and they're all kind of doing this thing at the same time. And I'm like, and that's that was very, very much yeah, very much like a, a I got a Raiders feel from the beginning. If you uh, didn't know what what the movie was about, you'd be like, oh, this is like an adventure film. They shot that on location, and that's a real dig. All that stuff you see is is that that's them really digging on a site. It's not that that wasn't a set. That's a yeah. real dig in Iraq, and uh, yeah. I, but you know, but I'm thinking of a scene too when when somebody met, uh, when when you mentioned the the sound effects, and then all of a sudden it gets really quiet. They did that in Poltergeist. There's a scene, remember, when they're all in the living room and all of a sudden, you, you know, it's like you hear this thing and all of a sudden, and then like, the, like everybody gets blown back, you know, like, the, you know, the father gets blown back in his chair and it's like, and then all of a sudden it's just quiet. It looked like a really bad cut, though. It, it wasn't quite as effective. It just looked like a bad edit. But I, but, the, you know, but there's a lot of that in this film. It's like yeah. just that those moments, you know. Yeah, that's jarring. It's very jarring. Andy, scary for you? What was scary for you? The freakiest stuff for me was um, so there. There was a an, an adult woman that was the size of Reagan that did all the kind of 
nasty bits that you know, like the crucifix scene and all yeah, that stuff yeah. or whatever. Can't and have, and can't the have a uh, kid doing that. And the, this uh, spitting up the pea soup. Um, there, it, there was a um, she had like a thing stuck in her mouth, but yeah. they ended up like painting that in anyway. But um, every once in a while, it'll cut to a shot where her stunt double is in the bed and not Reagan. So there's so her face is different, and yeah. there's one scene where Marin is over by the window and you're, you're on the other side of the room looking over at Marin and, and Reagan is there and she's got her head like sideways facing you directly. And she's got these gigantic wide eyes and this psychotic look on her face. It's just stuck. And yeah. it's not Reagan. It's the stunt double. And it's, it's silent. It's just a, like, he's talking and you just see her and it's just not her. And she's got this. Like, yeah. Gr- yeah. Like grim like weird grimace and her eyes are wide and it's not her. And it's just like, Oh God, you know, it's just so, it's so, <laughs> effective where it's just there's there's a couple of scenes in the in the movie where you um it's a visceral feeling like you you're you're, it's like like i said when you when he walks in and his mom's sitting on the bed you're not like ah and you're not like you're you're just Mm -hmm. got you're just you know it's a a weird (laughs) yeah it's an emotional response is that the scene where where she's lying on her side and then like the stuff's coming out of her mouth like um there's this i know what you're talking about there's a scene it's you can tell it's it's not Linda Blair. It's it's a it's. It, it might have been around it, that same time, but I it think looks, she's facing the other way on this. Yeah, this it just shot, looked, it does. It looks really so speaking, freaky. Speaking yeah. of the pea soup, and speaking of how Friedkin would would treat his actors, um, Jason, you know they had they had practiced that scene with the when when it, she throws up on him, uh, and the way it was going to be filmed was hit, he got hit in the chest, but Friedkin when they rolled shot him in the face with it and that's his real reaction jason miller he wasn't planning on getting shot in the face with that it was yeah. supposed to be they practiced in the chest and friedkin and said okay pissed. let's you know let's let's tilt it up a little bit and right in the face and and you got the real reaction so yeah like i said eric like i said that like that kind of stuff doesn't really fly anymore no, um yeah. but he was you know got he got re, you know reactions uh got reactions i'm not con- and- i'm not condoning it but it's kind of like you know it would be a totally different film if uh, in the hands of anybody else or, and you know, he was just as good. I mean, he, he was brilliant with the French connection. There was a movie after this that, that came out the same year as star Wars called sorcerer, which is, a uh, was that Roy, Roy Scheider? Sh- Roy Scheider, which was a remake yeah. of wages of fear with about yeah. these down on their luck, gentle, you know, guys who had to transport nitroglycerin, yeah. to a fire to like you know to like a rope bridge and there's like harrowing you know terrain and the, you know because if if and, and you can't move unless the, you know, the truck will blow up you know with the stuff so it's like really really tense you know so that was an un, you know an underrated gem but star wars of course you know blew everything away that year when freaking uh, died i saw yeah. everybody talking about sorcerer i never heard it before but yeah. everybody was like see this movie so i need to check it out well i had the, i have the original but it's like i i didn't even know that he had made the i knew there was a remake but i didn't know he did it and then i watched it and i'm like oh man this is even better you know this is this is a really <laughs> good film and it's just it's so again very very sort of that realism that that natural type of acting and you know, he really was really good at what he what he did, and you know, well, yeah, to live and die, to, say, to know, live and die in, die in LA. In, LA. in the early didn't 80s. care for it when we saw it in the theater. That I, I think I saw it with you. No, you probably Dean. saw it with Johnny. Okay, and yeah. I didn't care for it then, but now I've watched it again, and I'm like, yeah, this uh, this is a movie that's much better than I remember. Yeah, you know, so there's, you know, of course he didn't get these movies weren't as big. Uh, yeah, these, the, these three films are probably considered his best, but, uh, but yeah, he had some really good stuff and he was just very outspoken for film and just much like, you know, Robbie was for, for music who, who died in the same week. And I kind of want to pay tribute to both. And we did. And, you know, Dean came up with the idea of doing separate, just talking about a really great piece of work for both. And, you know, so, which was the better, better way to go. But, um, but yeah, it just two geniuses that we lost in, in the same week, yeah. which was, yeah. you know, it, they're just dry, <laughs> dropping and it's, it's sad, but, uh, but yeah, but this stuff lives on, you know, this movie will, you know, never gets old. It's, I, I think it gets better with time. Uh, yeah. I, I'm pretty at the point where I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it might be in my top 10 because it's just so well made and just so it still leaves a great impression, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. it's not uh even though it's of its time, it's not dated. Um, yeah. 
Be- because yeah. because uh, you know, um, it's not gimmicky. Yeah, the stuff hasn't aged poorly. You know that you can watch this and be and still just scare the crap out of you. Um, and and like like Andy said, you're getting top notch performances. You're getting act. You're getting actors oh, yeah. actors yeah. in this, right? <laughs> yeah. No, honestly, that you know, and that that does make a difference when they're invested in it on a, on a different level, mm-hmm. right? They're invested in it on an acting level, which kind of brings a different dynamic than oh, you're going to be running from somebody for you know two thirds of the film. It's kind of like yeah. okay, well then I gotta you know make sure I look right running. Yeah. You know, yeah. this, since this was such a slow roll, it's like I said, it's more of a dramatic thing. So those actors need to let those, you know, find those beats with the character. Like Andy said, those little moments yeah, that, that help you connect it, whether it's Karis with his, with his mother or Karis at the bar, you know, or Reagan and Chris together or Chris with the, with the, the assistant and, and slowly losing her temper with her and just kind of becoming more and more unhinged. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That that's what, that's what grounds this film is you can watch. It's not like, Oh, you know, it, it's, it's shitty until you get to the end and then the end is really screwed up. It's like, no, you can watch, you can watch this and kind of just let it, let it unfurl. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's, I think that's going to do it for this episode. What do you think, Andy? Covered the bases? Anything we left out? No. I think that, oh, don't, that's don't all, see, that's all. don't see the second one. See the third one. Don't yes. see the, don't see the, the fourth one. <laughs> <laughs> right we uh, skip the yeah, one with no, skip, skip the pre yeah skip the prequels yeah. skip the pre- both skip of them it. both of them were i mean and one then the, was, jur- like, the Paul- jury's out about the new one with russell crowe because that hasn't come out yet right or it's, it's out now well, it's, or- it's out but that okay. i don't think it has anything to do with oh, i thought no, it was this this unit it's oh, a it's okay. a different thing okay. the pope's it, exorcist was, yeah. yeah i thought that was yeah. Yeah. There was one uh, other possession movie. Uh, I, I, it was with the, Le- Leslie Nielsen. It was called Repossessed with yes, Linda Blair. Yes, that's it. it was with <laughs> Leslie Nielsen. Uh, no, uh, you walked sis- into it. I'm sorry. <laughs> the sister from um, Dexter. Uh, it was called the Possession of. I don't think it was the Emily Rose. It was one of the other ones, but uh, whichever one had her in it, Jennifer Carpenter. Uh, I remember it being really good. Um, oh. But it, you know, but of course she does the contortion things immediately or whatever but yeah uh, i got to the point where there was like there was an, another one of those exorcism like franchises or whatever they did the second movie and the poster was the girl bent into a number two paranormal like, activity probably or one of those <laughs> right like yeah, yeah, like, you, like everything has to like all the joints the have to bend like the yeah. like the opposite ways like your elbows have to bend the other way so it's creepy and yeah yeah it's like nah it, forget it i remember yeah, we we saw the prequel together andy i remember yeah. um actually uh because i think it was paul schrader wanted to go really heady with it and they didn't the studio hated it so they recast i mean stellan scars is in both versions so they got rennie harlan of all people who did die hard 2 to do the second you know the second version and it was just yeah. like, and when the thing, when the people get to possess, like the, I remember she looked exactly like Linda Blair, like the yep. same exact makeup. Yep. And it's, Cause this demon, this is what he does is he makes yeah. everybody look the same. You know, there's the same scarring, the same look, you know, <laughs> she was, a, she know. was immediately, she was immediately possessed. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and she, she like did that thing where she turned around and she was possessed and she had the scars <laughs> on her. It, it was, it was the exorcism of Emily Rose from 2005. Um, okay. She was, yeah, Jennifer Carpenter was really good. Wow. Um, but um, yeah, cool. I good stuff. That's it. One nothing of my favorites. Else. That's it. Uh, nothing, no close. Nothing in closing. This is like I said. This is one of your tops. So, uh, you, this uh, comes highly recommended, right? Especially now. Yeah, it's just. Um, Do you watch uh, it every year? Eric Eric watches yeah. it once a year. I watch yeah, it I once like a year. And Dean made before we started. Dean was like, "So this is around this time. A hol- is it a Halloween movie?" You watch it around Halloween only, or can you watch this any time of the year? I guess well, my wife and I start in the beginning of September and just watch, you know, a couple of horror movies a week all the way up until Halloween. Like sometimes mm-hmm. we do like one a night, but then it get, becomes a, like a chore to figure out, you know, unless we yeah. list it out beforehand. But, uh, you know, it's always on that list. It's always, you know, once a year. And my daughter saw it for the first time this Ooh. year as well. Yeah, so did and, uh, my, so did Jacob. He he yeah. watched it the other night with us, and he, you know, it's one of the greatest movies that I've ever seen. You <laughs> <Yeah>. know, <laughs> and, but he just goes, but it's terrifying. <laughs> but, but you know, we skipped uh, the uh, crucifix scene. Uh, you know, know. Uh, but it's harsh. Know. It's very harsh. Yeah. yeah. 
So, yes, so sir. Eric, so then you, you, you don't necessarily watch it during the holidays, but you say I, you watch I, it once a year. I haven't, right? I've, I haven't done okay. it yet, but I could. Yeah. Like I, I, I think this is a, I, I think that's kind of point. I'm, I'm, I guess it's, it's, it's that kind of a movie where you can, it's not just a horror film where, yeah. you know, you could watch it any, at any time and yeah. just be in, you know, psychological. You want to, yeah, exactly. So psychological yeah, drama. It's great okay. for um, Valentine's day. <laughs> there you go. Celebrate Valentine's day with the one you love. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, as of the recording of this episode, it is available to stream on Max HBO. So uh, if you've got that subscription, you can go check it out. It's the original theatrical version, not with the uh, extra stuff, but you don't need it. Just go with the theatrical version. That's what scared the crap out of everybody. So uh, Andy, thank you so much for joining us, man. You don't have to thank always. me. I'm happy to be here. Anytime. Ah, I still, it's always, it's always fun to, to get you in here and I'm, uh, yeah, like I said, in, in the beginning, if you're just joining us, there'd, there'd be no reason for someone to be listening to the last two minutes of a podcast. But if you are Andrew Kareen's art, go hit him up on Instagram. We're going to put a link in the uh, in the show notes. So go check him out. Oh, follow I, him. Follow him and see what he's doing. His adventures. I do have one 30 second thing. Uh, sure. Last time I came up to visit uh, the Cooper family, we stopped at the filming locations in Georgetown with my family. And I took mm. pictures on the staircase. And I, I brought with me printouts of, because I love the movie so much, uh, shots from the movie. And I recreated uh-huh. the the exact shots and found where they were and that sort of stuff. It was really fun. It was like, uh, so, I mean, that whole area is just really. I think it's, it's time really for you neat. to repost those. Maybe, sure. For the, yeah. For the holiday. Yeah. For the Halloween yeah. holiday. But. We'll do. Cool. Yeah, it's kind of as iconic. Why are these, why are these long staircases so iconic? The one in Joker. Right, the one in the Bronx. Yeah, that everybody, everybody yeah. was going to that one, and it's in like the worst part of the Bronx. But yeah, uh, it's these <laughs> they're long not, they're not, that they're not exactly yeah. in the greatest neighborhoods. <laughs> <Yeah. You know? laughs> it's like, but, wow, yeah. okay. But anyway, uh, yeah, thank, thanks, Andy. We appreciate. It. Thanks yep. for coming yep. on. So it's always a great Anytime. time. So, uh, and thank everybody for for joining us as well. Again, you know, you can find us each and every week, every Thursday, new episode drop. Plus, is a whole treasure trove. Of of other stuff. Andy has been on other episodes, uh, a lot of Halloween stuff too. So if you go back, we we've done a, a bunch every year. We kind of, we kind of do some of the Halloween stuff. So uh, there's more there to listen. And plus, uh, you know, per Eric's request, the history of Ben Cooper uh, in a six minute, <laughs> in a six minute, six minute dose. So for Andy, for Eric, this is Dean asking you to please be kind and rewind. You've been listening to the 3324 podcast with Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please like, subscribe, and rate to become a part of the 3324 family. Your feedback is important, so make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324podcast and on Twitter at 3324p to join the conversation. 